Welcome to this rapid revision session on the Battle of Hastings. Let's look at a bit of context. These are the events leading to the Battle of Hastings. I've already done some videos on these, so if you don't know about them, you can sure always check them out there. So, first of all, on September the 18th, or thereabouts, Harald Hardrada from Norway invaded the north of England, sailing up the Humber. On September the 20th, he met the Saxons in battle at Gate Fulford. The Vikings won this battle. However, this was soon followed on September the 25th by the Battle of Stamford Bridge, at which Harold Godwinson, having moved north from the southern, his southern defences, was able to defeat Hardrada and kill him and his brother Tostig. After that, though, September the 27th, William was able to set sail from England, arriving at Pevensey the day after. On October the 2nd, Harold left York for yet another long march. Hoping to get surprise, he arrived in London on about October the 6th and began to regather some forces. He could have spent longer doing this, though. Instead, overconfident in the tactic of surprise after his victory at Stamford Bridge, he decided to face William sooner. So on October the 12th, Harold set off for Hastings, and two days later, it all went wrong for him. October the 14th, the Battle of Hastings, Harold was killed, William had won. I'm about to show you one of my battle map presentations where I will go through the main events of the battle. This is on a simplified Microsoft Paint drawn map, but it should give you the main points. All battles and how they went are a matter of interpretation. So have a think about the way that preparations are important here, whether there's any fortune that's involved, whether there are, there are any failures with Harold's leadership and successes with, Will, with Williams. If, if, by understanding that, you should have a really good overview of the battle. So without further ado, let's have a look at what happened during the Battle of Hastings. The first thing is to look at the battlefield itself. It was fought on a hill called Senlac Hill. Harold had decided to block the top of Senlac Hill with a shield wall, preventing William from breaking out and getting to London. He put his best troops in the front of this shield wall, a mixture of Huskarls, or Housecarls, Thanes, and also his brothers, commanding each flank, Leofwin and Gerth. King Harold and his bodyguard were in the centre, in the thick of the fighting too. An important part of Harold's leadership style was inspiring his men by fighting alongside them. However, this meant that he couldn't have any flexibility and he couldn't issue commands once battle had been joined. So he was really relying on Leofwine and Gyrth to uh, provide discipline to his flanks. Following the loss of 5,000 men at Stamford Bridge, Harold was also relying on barely trained and barely equipped feared soldiers as well. He knew that if gaps began to form in his front line, he would have to replace them with less high quality soldiers. Nevertheless, this is a strong defensive position at the top of the hill. The forest on either side would also provide an obstacle for William's cavalry, and King Harold knew this. His battle plan, therefore, was very simple. Hold the top of the hill, stay there, and make sure that the, the Normans couldn't break through. Eventually, attrition would tell, and they would have to sue for peace, or else be killed. But it didn't work like that. William was ready, and he had a flexible and well-prepared army. In its first row, William had archers. King Harold could have had archers as well, but he hadn't brought any with them. There is some suggestion that he had refused to pay them after Stan uh, Stamford Bridge and that he had dismissed them, or simply that he hadn't been able to gather them. Whatever the reason, this might cost him. William followed up the archers with infantry. These were well-trained soldiers with shields, mail armour and spears and swords. Then bringing up the rear was William's most devastating and powerful force, his cavalry the horses which had been, been brought across the, the channel at such expense and such difficulty were now to be used. As we can see, William had allies as well, the Normans in the centre and the Bretons and the Flemish on the flanks. So William was ready for battle to begin. He had to break through and so he had to make the first move. He moved up his archers. They loosed their arrows into the shield wall, but with little effect. Most of the arrows either went into the side of the hill, sailed over their heads, or thudded into the shields. Sure, a few Saxons would have been killed, but really there was no huge effect. The archers had failed to break through. And so William moved his infantry into position and sent them into attack. Exhausted running up the hill in all of their equipment, they hit the shield wall, killed some of the Saxons, but took heavier losses themselves. They fell back. Now William might be seen to be getting desperate, so he decided to send in his most powerful soldiers in an attempt to break through. 
The cavalry smashed into the shield wall too. But like the infantry before them, they failed to break through, with losses on both sides. William so far had failed to break through, but his troops had maintained their discipline, so he could have another go at attacking the hill. Unbeknownst to him, it appears that there had been a breakdown in discipline, possibly because Leofwin and Geirth had been killed. This is entirely possible. It was now less left to less experienced thanes and housecarls to command themselves, and in places actually there were gaps, and as I said earlier, these were being filled by less experienced feared soldiers. The Norman attacks on the flanks of the army, which is pretty standard practice, had meant that the attrition or losses had been highest here. So that is where William was going to focus his next attack. As it happens, uh, during this, his next attack, a rumour spread through the, the Norman army that the Duke was dead. This wasn't the case, but it did cause a panic on William's left, and the Bretons fled down the hill. Now, one can, one can only suppose how disciplined the Saxons would have been here if Leofwin and Gerth had still been alive. However, with them dead, the inexperienced feared, seeing the, the uh, Normans run down the hill, felt that actually they must be near victory, and they gave chase. Perhaps at this point, if King Harold had ordered a general advance, it would have caused a mass panic and he would have won the battle. But he was being cautious. He knew he didn't have enough men to play with, and so he ordered the rest to stay at the top of the hill. The feared who had left the hill, though, well, they were now isolated and outnumbered. And perfect prey. Because William lifted his helmet and said, I live and with God's help will conquer still. Only with a French accent, presumably. And he sent his cavalry around the back of the, Bret the, uh, the pursuing uh, feared and slaughtered the lot of them. This gave William an idea. There is evidence that he had used fake or feigned retreats in earlier battles to tempt enemies out of strong defensive positions. Perhaps this is something that would work again. Duly, he focused his attentions on the opposing flank and again ordered a fake retreat. And this time the feared duly followed them. Having taken the bait, William swept round them with his cavalry and slaughtered them too. By this point, King Harold's situation was getting desperate and his shield wall was getting seriously thin, with more feared troops filling the front row. Even Harold is said to have been fighting fiercely within the thick of it. So when Har uh, William decided to order his final attacks, he decided that the now weakened shield wall was ready to be softened up even further by his archers. He ordered them to loose their arrows both high and low, and the shield wall was now sufficiently thin that they couldn't prevent this happening. According to the Bear Tapestry, at least as we presume, Harold was hit in the eye by an arrow. Whether this killed him outright or simply wounded him and incapacita incapacitated him, we do not know, because there is some evidence to suggest that he was later cut down by knights and mutilated as well. At this point, though, with King Harold dead... William sent the rest of his forces in to crush the remaining Saxon army. Duke William had won, and he became King of England. Soon. But how he would have to consolidate his power, we'll look at in a future video. Some final points then. William won the battle because of preparations. He prepared a powerful, well-trained army and organised their transport across the sea. Leadership. William was a brave and inspiring leader. So was Harold, but he was unable to communicate with his less experienced army effectively. And because of luck and good fortune, William was fortunate, or he was tipped off, that Harold was in the north when he landed, giving him time to consolidate. It was also lucky that Harold was killed right before the battle would have ended because of nightfall. But whatever the result, English history would be changed forever. And that, in brief, is the story of the Battle of Hastings. Thanks very much for watching. I hope it's been useful. And if it has, please like this video. If there's something that you're desperate for me to do as a rapid revision video in the near future, please request it in the comments below and I'll see what I can do for you. Thanks very much and goodbye.